Hello everyone, my name is Slater Betts, of course, and uh, today I have with me Pastor Bernard Lee, who is in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I met Pastor Lee, uh, let's say 2013, and uh, have grown very close to him, and he has been like a father to me uh, pretty much since I've known him, and have uh, had many opportunities to share with uh, the body up there in Vancouver over the years. Uh, Pastor Lee, good morning. Hey, good morning, Slater. <laughs> Wait to see your, your bright and cheerful face. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, fresh shave. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, we're doing these interviews uh, to talk about where Christians stand as far as um, uh, voting and uh, what the Lord is saying about all of this. And we'll go through some of the questions about, you know, where we uh, stand on this. And even though Pastor Lee is not an American, I know for sure that he loves this nation and he has the heart of God uh, for America uh, as the U.S. sits uh, at the top of all nations in all the world. And so everyone should have a vested interest in what goes on here uh, for that reason. So let me ask you, Pastor Lee, um, has God spoken to you or have you had any um, inclination at all about this particular election in the U.S. this year? Well, first of all, of course, uh, it's a joy to be connected uh, with the body in yeah. America, specifically through uh, Slater, you and Brittany and the group around you. Um, so although I, I, I'm still a Singaporean, but permanently resident in Canada, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no nation I'd rather be under than the United States of America. <laughs> ah, really? Now, you know, that's, that's very controversial to say. Yeah, the only time in my life, I say, oh, yeah, I want to be an American. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so maybe that's why you know, mm -hmm. um, there is a connection there. And, um, and what uh, my, my real involvement in politics, uh, so-called to observe it, was when uh, Donald Trump came in his first time you know, a few years ago into the debate. At that time, I only knew him as a larger than life figure, very loud, uh, you know, uh, very confident. So didn't have a positive impression of him. Neither do I despise him or dislike him. I just say, oh, okay, he's one of those big personalities. But the first time I heard him on the platform in that bid for the presidential the nominee, and I, I felt of all the candidates, I could see something in him uh, very clearly. He really has a heart for America and he really uh, spoke like someone who could uh, write out a destiny for America. Mm. And so, um, so I began to uh, name him at that time that this is God's choice if I were God, right? And so anyway, it, it turned out that he did get that place and confirmed by a different prophetic way. Uh, and over the years, and even specifically through all this turmoil in this past few years as, his, uh, as he steps more and more into his presidential role, I, I would catch him many moments where I could see uh, his heart, uh, very uh, tender towards the people. Yes, he's very outspoken, very loud, uh, and perhaps very uh, unwise in some of the way he gestured himself. But seeing through all that, what I'm looking for uh, in a leader, uh, if I were an American, is someone who really uh, should be the leader, right? And mm -hmm. so, so I felt uh, at various moments, very clearly, I see it in his eyes, I hear it in his tone and in his language uh, that he has those qualities uh, that make, uh, not just for uh, a leader, but a good one and possibly a great one, not just in the eyes of men, but even in the eyes of heaven. And uh, so, but he, he does have his flaws, uh, but I could also see why uh, he is uniquely postured to be. And so, so I do feel that uh, uh, America uh, needs someone who is strong, 
And it could be someone else. It could even be Joe Biden if he has those qualities or yeah. some, some other person. And, and this will not be, you know, the only presidency where there are great contenders all through the history of America and in the years to come. Mm -hmm. You know, the Lord willing, it, there will be many potentially great ones. So they have to come into their destiny. Uh, so I would say that um, I have a, uh, for me, I would say, yes, if I were American, uh, I feel that God would want me to, sh to identify someone like uh, Trump with these qualities and stand with him as long as, uh, you know, I can, uh, I, I, I can see the purposes of God working through him. And I do see God's purposes working through him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then let's talk about what a lot of Christians on the fence, and I'm speaking directly to Christians about this, who you know really can't get past, um, like you said, the loudness, the brashness that Trump is. Um, and because what comes to mind is Isaiah chapter 11, mm -hmm. um, how it says of the Lord Jesus that he would not judge by what his eyes see or what his ears hear, but with righteousness and equity. And, and so how, how should a Christian go about making a judgment call um, such as this? Like, is God even involved? Okay, uh, that's very good. You know, uh, everyone acknowledges whether Christian or non-Christian, that everyone uh, has, uh, uh, has certain challenges and certain realities of personality and so forth. Um, so um, the, the most moral person is not necessarily uh, the person who can be uh, the best leader or even a good leader. So leadership uh, is leadership. And so we see uh, many great people with many great flaws uh, throughout the history of men, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you are looking for a leader for a nation, you're looking for a leader who truly would make that nation a great nation. And a great nation uh, is seen when, uh, when there's, you know, the biblical passage most central to uh, a leadership at the highest level is in Deuteronomy 17. And in fact, Deuteronomy 16 to 18, you can say, uh, it's like the constitution of the government of a kingdom under God. So, and so every Christian should, should read that. Uh, so, and God requires so the first part of Deuteronomy 16, at least three times a year, every grown-up person must come before God, who is the king over all the leaders in all the realms from the earth to the heavens. But then as you go on, letter half of 16, on, he, he speaks directly to the people as a whole and say, okay, this is how you're going to set up your community, uh, set up judges across the land, Etc., and then resolve the issues. And if you really can't, then going into 17, if they're more difficult, bring them to the central authority in the place uh, where I will put my, you can say, Supreme Court, and that we know turned out to be Jerusalem, and there they will handle the issues. But then mm -hmm. when you get to that place where I will put my name, you're going to ask for a king. And so here are the things of my heart. And so we pay attention uh, to those things. Uh, and in that place, you know, you'll see uh, three temptations to avoid uh, for that leader chosen or that king, and then three tests, right? And, mm. so, and so if we kind of uh, look into that more closely, uh, uh, then you, you would see that uh, the larger issues, yes, there's a certain measure of morality required, but it's much more right? Much more. And so we, uh, and then uh, if we can understand it from heaven's perspective, what God really wants and why, then we can answer the questions whether it's a Trump with some failures, 
personally or Biden, perhaps he has some shortcomings personally or within his family. So we can evaluate each person from heaven's perspective. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for uh, bringing that up, especially Deuteronomy uh, 16 to 18. Uh, those Now, I have been reading this uh, lately just to get a perspective of how God sees things. And uh, again, this is where a lot of Christians struggle. You know, why do they vote anyway? People will say, well, God's will will be done no matter who is in office. So why do we need to even participate in voting? Okay, uh, uh, that, that is a legitimate thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have never voted once in my life, so confession. <laughs> and I've been born, uh, here I don't have the right to vote, right? So um, I've never uh, really been seriously involved in politics. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, but obviously we uh, uh, we are given a privilege when we can vote. It's a very powerful thing. And so the majority of people should exercise that uh, unless you're, like for me uh, and my wife, we're caught in circumstances where we're either out of the country or you know some other reason. So very early in our life when we could vote, we already left our own home country. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we didn't get to vote. And, so since we're not citizens in this great land, so we don't vote. Uh, um, so, um, so taking a vote, especially for um, a nation, America is a great nation. And the reason why there are a few factors and one of them is uh, it has an open acknowledgement of God. And the, mm. the very opening you know, First Amendment is, okay, everyone's faith is respected, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, and that's very important. So Christians must not marginalize non-Christians and people of other faiths. And so, uh, so let's stand up as those who own that there is a high reality of us, and that's very precious. And only in America do you see in such an open public way, such a strong succession of leadership that openly acknowledges heaven, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I believe that's also uh, one of the reasons why America is pushed really by the fact that God could look for no other nation who would openly acknowledge heaven. And God is, through the Old Testament we see, God is not afraid of, of all the competition so-called of the other gods. If they are not gods, they are not gods. Right. Or even if they are powerful, entities, they are all under the sovereign uh, control and, uh, you know, and purposes of God. So God is not afraid of challenges. So we should not be afraid of uh, different faiths within the same land. It is because of that that you can see why uh, the God, uh, who is the true God, uh, clearly is expressed most uh, powerfully and truthfully through the scripture, through the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, so, we don't want America to lose that direct contact with with heaven, right? And so, uh, one of the three tests of the great king, in fact, the final one is: this man must not put him, himself above every other man, this leader, but he must uh, be governed by this law that comes down from heaven. This, this law that comes down from heaven. And so there must be an acknowledgement. And then one of the uh, three, uh, what do you call, challenges to temptations is, is that the heart must not stray back to a slave mentality. So it must, it must not be captured by things that bring oppression to one's life. So America, because... Uh, at the highest level, and Trump is somebody who openly says, I love you, and he openly acknowledges God, openly brings uh, around him godly people. This is very, very important and very precious, and we want to protect that, not just for Christians, but for all the faiths. So that's the reason why uh, uh, we want to also uh, speak out the desire of God for a nation and for a nation to be great because there's that open dialogue with God. Many other nations of the world, even 
nations that have come into some glory in the past, they don't have that open dialogue, that openness, all right? And when a leader speaks openly from their heart and can name individuals or directly look in the face, I really love you, that's a very bold statement. Mm -hmm. It must come from something much deeper and higher. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So since you're along that line, let me ask you something you said earlier. Um, is that back during the uh, first election cycle that Donald Trump was a part of when he was going for the nomination of the Republican Party. Um, you said that you could see and hear um, something in him that you, you thought was precious to the Lord enough to place him in office. Could we talk about some of those things that you saw and heard uh, with him specifically? Well, I guess what came across was uh, I could hear him. I could hear his voice, right? So Trump's own voice. And with the other candidates, except for maybe one or two, uh, I was hearing uh, the voices of popular opinion or the voices of political persuasions or leanings. But I, I had an authentic voice. Uh, truth in the inward parts is something the Lord really treasures, yeah. right? So yeah. uh, you can be rotten to the cause and apple, but you know it and you, you, uh, <laughs> and you speak out of that. And uh, so, so, pe so Trump is somebody who he cannot, he, he's, ex he's as exposed as anyone could be exposed, right? Yeah. So, uh, of course, we would want him to understand how to deal with that. Uh, so he does, he does have uh, certain things that he can actually um, uh, move out from uh, that, that keeps him from his much fuller uh, 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 stepping into the office of the presidency. So, but at least we have to start with somebody who is willing to go to the deepest part of their heart and then speak to the real issues. So a real leader uh, among the people have to speak to the real issues and dare to speak it at any cost. And so I saw it in Trump. That's awesome. I, uh, I agree with you. I remember us talking the first time about this and you asked me, uh, who did I think should be the nominee? And I said, uh, anybody but Donald Trump. <laughs> and, and you told me, you said, uh, that's the one I think God wants. I remember I was sitting in your living room <laughs> we were talking about it. And I said, I don't know. Uh, because, see, I had a hard time getting past what I considered very arrogant, proud, mm -hmm. and all this. But then when I started to really, like you said, hear him right. and, and hear what he was really going after, I knew he wasn't a career politician. Right. I knew he wasn't just talking to gain favor. I knew he was speaking from his own heart. Like, this is what our nation needs. This right. is what I'm going to fight for. And I think that's what began to resonate with me before the Lord even showed me that he wanted Trump in office. Um, that's what began to like really stick out, like you were right. saying. So even in my own ignorance, uh, the Lord, you know, graced me to be able to hear beyond um, my judgmental attitude towards him, I would say. And so um, with, with that, can we talk about... Um, I guess a more pointed question about all of this, what would be God's theological purposes behind an election like this? Um, or as in any other election in this nation or in the nations of the world, um, but particularly with America, what would be his, his grand purpose behind this and why should Christians stand with that? Uh, that's a very, uh, a very, very central question. Uh, really the theological purposes of God, why we are even here, right? And uh, why are we in this generation? Now, remember when God began to want to build a family on the earth, he started with one man, Abraham, and then Sarah, and he prophesied uh, to him and to Sarah that nations would be birthed out of her, and even uh, kings, right? And kings over nations. So it's always in God's uh, plan and purposes to bless nations with good kings and great nations. So, uh, and so he, he needed to start with a family 
Uh, of course, he had a purpose to look into uh, the real understanding of kingship will come when King Jesus or Messiah Jesus would come to show the model of the, uh, the man uh, of God who is also a real son of God. So this concept of son of God is in many ancient uh, cultures, even in China. We understand that the king is a son of God, or even in, in Rome, by the time of Jesus, they understood that the king is the son of God, and his kingdom has responsibility to make sure that everyone prospers because there is um, the, the creator or you know, the almighty, whatever name you give him, and then you are responsible to bring that uh, his goodness, his greatness into all uh, the land. And, uh, and, and so, so there is uh, that, uh, that purpose of God to bless every nation of the world. Yes, God is not really into politics the way we are into politics, right? Uh, God is really in, into government and good government so that his goodness would be given to the nations of the world. Now, in the Old Testament times, God intended for Israel with that 12 tribes uh, to become uh, the nation that is lifted above all the nations of the world so as to show the goodness of God, not only to its own nation, but to the nations around, to teach them the ways of God which are just, right? And that the ways of God are altogether righteous and true. So, so God had always meant that uh, there should be a family, and in this case, a nation, to model that to all the nations of the world. And, uh, and so uh, we must see whichever nation sits at the top of the nations of the world, whether, you know, whether whatever the, the history or whatever, uh, you know, the, the present dynamics, that nation who we want to sit at the top of the nations of the world must be a nation capable and willing to to express uh, the goodness of God and to show that God is kind, He's generous, He's, uh, he's forgiving, and He's, uh, he's intelligent, He's full of resources. And America has all that. And the only reason uh, why it is being legitimized to sit there is because it still has an open acknowledgement to the Almighty above. And so um, if America does not come up to this. Right now, we don't see any other nation capable of doing that, of spreading the goodness of God all around. So if America rises because the blessing of heaven is with it, because it's fulfilling the purposes of God to bless all the nations of the world, yes, including uh, the enemies of America, so, so-called. But you know, China is not an enemy, we know. It's just certain leadership, certain political leanings. So, uh, so America has modeled uh, within its, its history uh, the, the ability and the willingness to, to help other nations, right? It has demonstrated among other things. Some things is done poorly through different administrations, but many things is done very well. And so I would say that uh, America sits better than any other nations of the world to fulfill God's theological purpose of bringing blessing to all the nations of the world. So you now you're, you're um, hitting an interest point for me. And so I want to ask you this kind of off the cuff here, but is from what you, from what you just said about um, whatever nation sits on top of all the other nations of the world, they have a responsibility. Um, number one, the open communication to the Lord and spreading his goodness and modeling what he desires to all the rest of the nations of the world. Would you say then that throughout history and throughout time, how God has raised up and brought down a nation has been based on that thinking, that line of thinking of the nation that sits on top, whether it's um, Babylon or Rome or any other government uh, or nation that has ruled the world at some point in history, um, would you say it was, at least in part, the Lord saying, okay, they have not fulfilled that purpose. I'm going to bring them down and raise up another. 
Uh, in some parts, yes, and in um, most parts, no. And the reason why you can look at the nation of Israel itself, when it got to its promised land, when it's got its kingship established, especially a man after God's own heart, like David. What does that mean? A man after God's own heart, which is King David. The word heart refers to the mind, right, in the Old Testament. So a man who thinks the thoughts of God, you can say. So it's not just a romantic, emotional love uh, that perhaps parts of the Christian faith and other religions have fallen into, which is, uh, which feels good, but it is a trap. Because we think that just by feeling good, by being enthusiastic, by being passionate, that we really uh, are uh, the person after the God's heart. Or this whole movement is after God's heart because we can dance better, we can shout louder, we can sing louder, we can proclaim louder, right? So a man after God's heart, if we're like a, a, a leader that God looks for, is someone who can think God's thoughts and then have a desire or have a will inside the mind, and of course we use the, the term heart, to want to uh, live it out. Uh, now, God is looking for every generation of a king in Israel or in the split kingdom for someone like David, right? Who, he has flaws, many flaws. In fact, he, he has committed, you know, he has committed all the greatest sins that we normally associate with, right? But yet, why was he so specially favored? Because God could not find uh, someone like him who could think his thoughts. And then, only when you can think somebody's thoughts, then you could really feel what that somebody is feeling. It's not the other way around. Oh, I feel so great. And you know, people go, why do people gravitate to pop stars and all that? Because you feel so good somehow. But if you really can come and think their thoughts, you don't feel so good, right? So, so, so we have to kind of see it from God's point of view. Yes, he meant every generation uh, who was governing the land in Israel, uh, the kings from, from the house of David or later from the other tribes. Uh, they were supposed to be, right, bringing that greatness to the, its own people. Now, the, the leader of the land, according to Deuteronomy 17, uh, it's kind of hints to edit, but really in history, the king does three things, right? The leader, he defends against the outsiders, the enemies. So, and secondly, he def defends within. In other words, there are people in there uh, there are foreigners who have come in or carries a foreign spirit to that country, even though they are the citizens, and they are hurting the other people. So the king also has to protect the people within. So law and order is very important. And then, most importantly, the king has to defend the people against the wrath of God when you do evil. So, so in ancient days, uh, many kings are priests as well. So they have to appease the God of heaven. All right? But we know that the true and living God it's not appeased by human sacrifices and all kinds of that. He's appeased when your heart is aligned to his heart, which is, which is a heart that means good for everyone. So we have to keep all this in mind. So yes, God allows every government, every leader, even the worst person you can think of has an anointing upon him from heaven. It's an authorization. But just like you see the first king of Israel, Saul, he had an anointing on him. And that's why David could not touch him for evil, even though Saul meant evil for David. But the anointing upon David, it's of a kind that really brings out what and who God is, not just what he's capable of. So, so you see when uh, King Saul was touched by the Spirit of God, he could speak the words of God. And God could... You can say bend his will to speak God's words. But God wants a man who, God doesn't have to bend their will, but their will is really aligned to heaven. So they speak God's heart, even without God openly telling them. They already know or sense uh, what is the desires of God. So that's, that's what the New Testament is about. The New Covenant is about Jesus and the ones that come into a direct relationship with him of teacher and student, where now you are, taking on the heart of the teacher, his, his 
values, his philosophy, his ideals are now part of who you are. And so you, you are living that out. So he doesn't have to uh, take a cane, you know, and, uh, you know and, and in front of you or a carrot. But all he has to do is just sit, sit next to you or he can be somewhere else and he can trust you to always reflect his thoughts back. And so, and that's why there's a reason why we should see every government and every leader the way Paul sees it, you know, and he says, we, we really have to lift up holy hands because these are powerful for them so that they bring good to all the people uh, that they are leading. Now, they can be what you call your, even your enemies, right? And the, the governments of a different enemy uh, of, of of so-called a nation is at, at war with you, but we should still lift them up, that they will really bring goodness. But God's idea is that if you can be a nation that brings goodness to yourself, take care of the people, um, and then you can also spread your goodness to the other nations. And I think fu fundamentally, every leader understands that, but not every leader wants to live by uh, the instructions given for example, Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 to 20, those are powerful instructions. It, it cuts across every country, language, and religion. And that's why I think it's also in God's grand purposes that almost all the nations of the world are founded this way, like America is, or following America's model. You have the executive branch, you have the legislative branch, and you have the judicial branch. So authoritarian governments don't have that. But if you have these three branches, you can reflect that back to the instructions given in Deuteronomy 16 to 18. Except that the law giver is, the law is from heaven. So instead of the, 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 the Congress you know, the, uh, and the Senate writing laws, they are re really copying the laws from, say, the Bible or from heaven and rewriting them, right? So the closer a match, it's just that the king who has a personal copy, he has to write it personal copy of the law in the presence of these Levit Levitical priesthood who knew what is right, what is wrong. So there must be real teacher, real student to write the laws. And that's why for America, it is right to go back to the founding of the America as we know it today, over about 240 over years ago, and examine, you know, what was laid down. And, and uh, use common sense intelligence because times have changed and understanding have uh, been expanded in some areas and, and then work that within the spirit of the constitution uh, that looks at, you know, the executive branch and then the judicial and then the, you know, legislative. But if, if the leaders can reflect back to the Bible. And if let's say there's a Hindu text that gives as clear instructions as uh, say even just that passage in Deuteronomy says, and there are many, many other passages that speak about kingship, take them up and let's look at them on a fair basis, right? Because uh, the Bible does, is not the only source of understanding and knowledge that, uh, you know, because other people from other cultures, they do have texts uh, that do have basic common sense. And so, yes, bring them up for consideration, right? And so God is not against common sense. Okay, so I, I want to hit on something you said. You, you laid out these three things that um, a king or a president should, what we as Christians should look for in that leader, um, according to Deuteronomy 17, uh, one that would protect the people or protect the nation from foreign enemies, one that would protect within the nation um, domestic enemies or, or having law and order established, and then um, one who would stand between the people and God Almighty, right? Um, in, in other words, to appease the Lord or to align themselves with the Lord or the way that he thinks, like David was, um, in order to... Uh, not have the Lord to destroy or bring down that nation, 
is this something that you say that you see in Donald Trump more than any other candidate? Like at this present time, you believe that he would be the one that would hold true to that more so at this point? Okay, well, specifically those three functions are not directly explicitly uh, stated in uh, Deuteronomy 17, but they, they can be implied, but they are spoken throughout uh, the scripture. So, and, of, of, and, of, of, and they also speak uh, through the real history, right? So any great leader would protect against the enemies outside and the enemies within and would try to work with heaven. And so even the environmentalists trying to uh, say, you know, be environmentally more conscious is working with heaven to some extent. They may not acknowledge a personal entity, God, but they acknowledge something higher. So, so these three things, uh, three relationships between the leadership and the nation, right, uh, was always there. Now, Donald Trump, um, um, he definitely defends against yeah. it, right? So when you have your intellect, the best of your intellectual properties constantly taken away, right? And then, uh, and then your people are getting poorer and poorer. So obviously, that's something to defend against. Uh, and I think that he, uh, he has been very wise. Uh, he, he really doesn't engage in physical battles, right? So he tries to avoid that. So that's very wise. And yet he can win without a fight. What you want to do is always to win without a fight, right? <laughs> the enemy could surrender before you even have to kind of uh, pull a single you know, cannon shot or whatever. So that's the great. So rather than think of the enemy surrendering, so now it's posturing. Uh, so I think uh, Donald Trump is capable of that. You can see that he can extend his hand out to uh, the extreme opposite, you know, so of socialism, the leaders, and I think he, he really means it. But let's work it in a term, in terms that are fair. So, so that's great. So he he's able to defend. Uh, I think more than any other leader of the world right now, uh, in America, and even uh, nations which are unrepresented, and that's why everybody looks at America. Why would everybody look at America who's under oppression? Because America has shown that it is capable of standing on the side of strength and fairness uh, to, you know, prevent uh, certain uh, even uh, uh, or to to stop the flow of evil uh, decisions uh, and also perhaps to reverse some evil decisions. So. Uh, when Donald Trump was able to uh, broker peace in the Middle East recently, now that is also removing foreign threats because they don't have to fight each other. So, and then within, we can see uh, America and uh, you, among you and the people around you and others, and I, I hear a lot of uh, different Americans speaking, and many of them are Black Americans, and the life has changed. They have begun to have jobs and they, they, they are doing much better in the last few years. And so, uh, and, and so the statistics put out there, all I can do is to listen to them. And I think to be fair, he has uh, done a lot to defend the people and law and order because of uh, the kind of, uh, you know, outbreaks of, of writings and so forth. And that's human nature. So we can't, we can't overly judge and condemn the individuals that part of a culture and throughout the history of time when you're part of the culture and when you're young uh, and, and if you have foreign, foreigners come in or organizations that represent a different spirit of America come in to stir up the spirit. So people do uh, violent things. So, so some of the people who did that, uh, they're just swept by that spirit to grow with that. So, and we, we see Donald Trump and his administration wanted to do deal directly with that situation, establish that strong law and order. So that's doing that. And then, of course, the appeal uh, to heaven. And we know that uh, Mr. Trump surrounds himself with godly people, uh, starting from the one next to him, right? So you can say uh, Mike Pence uh, is, a, uh, is a better representation of, you know, uh, what uh, a, a good and a respectable leader is 
but he may not be as as great a leader as Trump, right? So he may be he may exceed Trump in many areas, but Trump is a, is a better leader, a stronger leader, and and I do see uh, Trump surrounding himself with strong leaders, and of course, strong leaders. Um, you identify people who can work, and so he, he fires a lot of people and rehires and fires again and rehires. Okay, that's part of, you know, it, his, we know what he wants is to make things work. Uh, and so we, we see very strong leaders right now in the Trump administration, all right? People who can pull their weight as the leader himself in foreign nations. And, and I, I have a huge respect uh, for, um, uh, Pompeo, right? I think he, he's, he's, he's kind of a, he represents a, a strength right there, right? And also uh, the others in the, even uh, the, uh, the White House press secretary. I saw her in CNN uh, years ago, and I thought, hmm, that's an outstanding individual, uh, Kaylee. I, I thought, so when, when she became the press secretary, I said, oh, about time, <laughs> she's the right person. So these are, because they represent uh, that strength of speaking, you know, real issues about the enemies outside, within, and about a relationship or responsibility, whether to God or to a higher reality. Mm -hmm. One of the things that stood out to me, Pastor Lee, was how Trump treats his political adversaries mm -hmm. and even wanting them to prosper and even wanting to work with them and uh, that's not something we typically see throughout our history. If you stand on opposite sides of the aisle, you're opposite. You're never going to like each other. Um, but constantly what we see with uh, President Trump is his ability to continue to extend what we would call a, an olive branch um, to even his political adversaries and wanting to say, okay, let's make it work for the entire nation not just the people who voted for me, but for everyone, right? Even those who despise him are prospering. Even those who hate him are, are living better lives than they have before. And to his credit, he enjoys that, you know? So that, that's one thing that I see in him that I, I say, man, the Lord could really use that, in, even in his own people, <laughs> right? to, you know, to bless your enemies, right? To love your enemies, to bless those who curse you, um, to pray for those who misuse you. Um, and what we see in that with uh, the president and why I'm going to vote for him uh, again in a few weeks um, is that type of love uh, from Christ's perspective being extended even toward his enemies. It's a phenomenal thing to watch that even this man who we could see is not as morally upright as uh, Mike Pence or as Christians in general, and, you know, he, he takes a lot of criticism for that, but I see in him working the will of God toward people uh, more so than I do with uh, the leadership, let's say, in the church at large, because even the leadership in the church is so split, and then they won't come to the table together, mm -hmm. um, and I see that differently in President Trump, so I, I think that's a, a, an excellent quality to have in leadership. Um, and I've seen uh, over the years and done a lot of research uh, how even his enemies, when they're in court battles and he liked the way that they fight in court, he'll go and hire them after the, the court battle is over. You know, people don't do those things. Yeah. But if he can see a good quality that says, I could use that on my team, right. I'd rather hire that person than to continue to be an enemy. Right. So um, and seeing that even with the, the leaders of the world, um, the uh, the leader of North Korea mm -hmm. and how they both said things about each other that were <laughs> uh, less than tasteful right, um, right. and still willing to come to the table and and make sure that there is peace between the two uh, is something that we have not seen in uh, previous administrations. Uh, I would say in my lifetime, of course, um, that if, if we made each other enemies, we're always going to be enemies. But with Trump, I can see that olive branch being extended. And, and so I'm bringing this up to ask this next, this next question. Um, and I guess to sum it all up, um, 
when when a Christian is looking to judge properly according to the ways of God, because you mentioned David and how uh, David was a man after God's own heart, or in other words, that he could think the thoughts of God. Um, so many people are marginalized uh, in this nation and throughout the nations of the world emotionally. If something doesn't feel good emotionally, they're automatically against it and are appalled that you aren't against it either. <laughs> so um, filtering through emotionalism and a Christian just looking at things as they are, um, how would we know then that, yes, this is, this is God's choice, this is, or, or even if we have not heard from God directly, and we look at these things and we say, according to the way that God thinks, which would be the better person? How would you say, Pastor Lee, a person goes through that, um, that thought process to set aside emotionalism and then stand in the place of God's true counsel? Okay, thank you, Steve. You have, uh, you have covered a lot of ground in this very, very uh, rich uh, commentary that you have just provided. Uh, and, uh, and you have brought us to the central uh, question, what has it got to do with me? And so uh, I think uh, for me, um, remember, um, leaders will come and go, and good ones, bad ones, uh, great ones, and very, you know, ones who turn out very poor performances. And it's not always the best leader who wins the race, right? So in other words, in many nations, it's not really the best leader for that nation who wins the race. Uh, but how have you, as someone who uh, have been involved in that, say, environment posture yourself? That's a bigger question. So even if your leader, who may be the best leader for that land, even God's first choice for that land, did not get elected. Through that process, how have you been exposed? Right? So every Christian that asks, you know, every citizen in the United States, where have you stood? So even if you stood and strongly for the leader who, who we know is the best leader for the country and he didn't come through, have you betrayed your own values? Right? So I think the first thing uh, in terms of uh, being just or, or standing for justice in the nation is standing where you are, are you being just? So I think uh, a lot of people, including Christians, have been drawn emotionally into taking, uh, into taking on a spirit of divisiveness. And so there are many things to kind of clean out to get ourselves in the place of justice. First of all, if you have gloated over, say, a negative comment about Trump or about Biden, or about each other, and you have gloated over that, you need to repent. You need to stop that habit of gloating at the failures or the exposures of the enemy. And you need to be careful about uh, not following the spirit. You know, both parties have shown that you take one statement or part of a statement and you blow it up, right, disproportionately. So that is uh, misrepresentation, falsehood, deceit. So if you have uh, uh, yourself kind of... Uh, been given to that you have sold part of your soul uh, to that kind of uh, deception. And so examined uh, our values. You know, three things the Lord spoke clearly to, uh, to my heart the morning of the presidential debate recently. Um, and I, you know, I, I think, and then I put those parts in A, B, C, A is have a spirit of appreciation. So appreciate one another and especially appreciate that these are two elderly gentlemen giving up their lives to take on the toughest job in the whole world. So have an appreciation for that. So don't beat one down while promoting the other. Secondly, believe. Suspend your disbelief. Give them the chance to, to believe that they mean what they say. So don't prejudge. So prejudgment is also something that violates justice at the most personal level to the highest level. 
And then third is critique. So the word critique means use a fairness of mind to bring critical awareness uh, to the whole situation. So don't just follow the masses. Don't just follow a platform and an opinion that, oh, I'm a Christian, I must vote Republican. I must, or, or I'm, I'm a Christian, I, I cannot vote this or I cannot vote that. So use your reasoning. And so it has to do with respect, really. The one word that governs this three uh, values of appreciation, belief, and critique is respect. Have a true, genuine respect and honoring uh, of one another, preferring one another above uh, others. So know who you are. As a Christian, if we really answer to our calling to true justice, we are kings and priests. So kings, you have the best brain. You are the best student in the class. Priests, uh, you have an understanding of how to bring people together. And Donald Trump, yeah, uh, he, you, you just know you said he was able to work with even his enemies and mm -hmm. negotiation. That's a priestly quality, yeah. very clearly, right? And then being able to think new thoughts uh, or great thoughts and, and negotiate with terms that would bring uh, a betterment of individuals in society. <laughs> if we have different values, uh, that's a great shepherd, you know, for senior pastors of churches, you know, in the, in the church body, there's always tensions and people who like your messages or don't like the way you like certain people or you, etc. So how can you not uh, be caught within that trap of that emotional uh, uh, kind of a, a turmoil and how can you rise above and see things clearly and then will yourself so in a, a way that you know reflects good leadership. So you're able to work through all that and deal with your personal uh, hurts. And so, so I guess for everyone, and that's, you know, with every person in every strata of society, know that. And uh, for Christians, the warning is don't think and don't speak only in Christian terms that you're familiar with. Think like a true son of heaven. Think like a true uh, king and a true uh, priest. So, so don't let your language or your action uh, be just kind of a, a, a crowded thinking, a, a, a crowded kind of action, a crowded kind of uh, attitude or crowded kind of behavior. You're generally going to be outside of justice. So, uh, but justice is the heart of God. And so let me give you one scripture that is very powerful. You know, we talk about Deuteronomy 16 to 18. And, uh, and at the end of uh, uh, 16, Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, you shall appoint judges and officials throughout your tribes in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you and they shall render just decisions for the people now, this is the words of God to the people of God. You must not distort justice. You must not show partiality. And you must not accept bribes, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. And here is this very powerful verse, Deuteronomy 16, 20. Justice and only justice you shall pursue, so that you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So the cry and the call for justice, justice is actually very, very central yes. to the idea of government should. And so it's not wrong, the cry is how you are expressing that cry and how you're understanding what justice is. Yes, that reminds me of uh, Psalm 89, right? Mm -hmm. Verse yes, 14, yes. the habitation of God's throne is yes. justice and righteousness, um, mercy and truth, or yes, chesed, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my Hebrew for the day. Um, but this is the way that God rules, right? And so when we look for a candidate, so who's going to pursue true justice and, and, and truth and, and uh, righteousness and mercy, right? Uh, for the peoples of that land, right? Who's, who's actually going to pursue that mm -hmm. is the one who is more closely aligned with the heart of God because this is what, like you read here in, in Deuteronomy 16, yeah. uh, this is what God has commanded, right? 
follow justice and justice only that yeah. we live, right? <laughs> so, so when we're, you know, trying to make decisions, these are the ways, especially for people who feel, um, well, I'm not having these grand experiences like others are having that's just point blank telling them this is what God wants. But we can, we can read the Bible, right? And we can gather from what God has commanded what we should be looking for. So thank you so much for uh, bringing that out, Pastor Lee. You know, I always, always enjoy our conversations. Uh, we've had many, many over the years that have helped me to understand uh, more clearly the ways of God, the mind of God. Um, and how God looks at things and how he judges them so that I can be in my own heart aligned with him uh, when he's rendering decisions that I don't go against him because of my own emotions or like you said, my past hurts or something in me that's hindering me from seeing clearly. And uh, yeah, so is there anything else that you wanted to share uh, before I let you go here? Well, I think uh, it's great to be an American. Um, and so- I agree. Uh, and remember, and if, if you, so don't go uh, be settled down with issues uh, that either are no longer relevant because we are in a different time and space, uh, perhaps same space, but of a different sort. So if you are, for example, Native Americans, uh, know that you're, uh, you're very much in God's heart and in my heart because God has shown us great things. So uh, you should be the best American represents, right? So you have welcome or you are forced to have nations come into the world, but this is something that happens through our history. People come into a different land all through our history. So we cannot deny history. And so, so, so or you are a new immigrant from a little country. So only in America, you can, you can, I think up to 14 years, if you're a citizen, you can even sit in the highest office in the land, only in America. And uh, so, so America is a great model for kingship. In Christ Jesus, you can be the worst sinner, you can become the greatest saint, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a model for that too. Um, and so uh, don't just uh, be an opinionated person. Everybody can have an opinion. In fact, everybody can have 10,000 opinions. We have too many already. <laughs> yeah, but you can have one good critical judgment that's justice for you. In other words, how do you come to a place where you're not just dishing out opinions, right? Mm -hmm. But you are speaking from a place of true judgment. So that involves yes. you to think like a real king. And so what is your model? So yes, you can learn from different philosophies, and but you are a Christian. This is like the, this is like the North Star and you know, the way you look at it is brightest and the clearest. And then there are little stars around. You can learn from you know, the philosophy of science, the philosophy of religion, or even you know, or other kinds of uh, knowledge. But if you don't know what is already given, so this is like your uh, legislation, right? So write out a personal copy. If you're a king, you want to study it. And with teachers, the Levitical priesthood, the king has to write in front of them. They can check that they, he has written rightly and understood rightly what those words meant. So you need to be in a teacher-student relationship. And Slater is a great teacher. So if, so if you, <laughs> you're part of uh, uh, that group, you know, you're very blessed uh, because... Uh, Great teachers are instructed. Oh, sorry. Uh, great leaders are formed through great teaching. So mm -hmm. the pastor, the teacher is like the priest. And every member in the congregation is like kings in the making. And so when we teach, mm -hmm. we are acting out our priestly capacity. Yes. And so the people that we shepherd, they are not our underlings. They're not our followers. But if I'm a true teacher, a true Levitical priest in that sense, and of course, uh, now in Christ, we are the, the Melchizedek priesthood. So we are much more than that. So what we are giving is instruction for kings. So think of yourself, if you are American especially, and if you are Christian, you know, you truly... Uh, you, you truly have been positioned in Christ already with a kingship greater than the kingship of the physical lens 
of the world. So you can live out that kingship through, um, through standing with heaven and looking at the situation. But heaven needs actual people in actual physical lands yes. to express the will of heaven. And yes. so some of these leaders, uh, you can see their flaws and their flaws are much more exposed than others. But instead of having a spirit of just criticism to attack them, have a spirit of critical reasoning uh, to give critical judgment. Okay, you see those flaws, uh, and, uh, but how are they in relation to, uh, you know, not all flaws are what you call evil. So when we say uh, this person is moral or immoral, uh, sometimes you're only using uh, the language that confines them in a kind of religious environment. Mm -hmm. A person that we see is more like the Pharisees in, in Jesus' days who opposed him, or even the Sadducees, right, in the highest place in the temple, uh, they were extremely moral, but in God's eyes, they were more corrupt than so-called the immoral people. So the values of heaven, the judgments of heaven, are not the values and judgment uh, that is, is uh, populated by the crowds. So be able to understand more and more. So lift our thoughts higher, sila, the word, right? Lift our thoughts higher. So yes. the thoughts of God. Yes. So get in touch with uh, people who really can instruct you in every field. And if you are a Christian, make sure that the people who teach you the word of God, they know the word of God. They really know the word of God. Now, whether they live the word of God or not, we can't decide. <laughs> we can't decide, right? But at least they know the word of God and they not only bring uh, the word of God, but they have the testimony of Jesus. So they understand the apostolic teaching. Much <coughs> of what is out there now depart from apostolic teaching. So be, yes. uh, be very familiar with what the apostles really emphasized and what Jesus emphasized, right? So the teaching or the doctrine of Christ must be the bedrock of the foundation of all our learning. Yes. So go into fanciful stuff, interesting stuff. Sometimes some prophetic teachings are very interesting, very, uh, very fascinating, but they have departed from uh, the apostolic foundation. Uh, uh, the one five. All right, let me uh, give you this one scripture, which if we keep it in heart, uh, perhaps will give us a, a clearer focus. Now, there are three what we call pastoral epistles. And so, what's the scripture again? Oh, First Timothy chapter first. one and verse five. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, is it Second Timothy now? When my brain is shot. Uh, yeah. Yes. Right? So it says here, yeah. Oh, is that verse 5? No. How come? Oh, yeah. It's first Timothy. I was telling the second Timothy. Go. For a moment. Getting it wrong. So this will give us a, a focus. Now remember, the pastoral epistle is really focused on the foundation of our teaching in the new covenant. Mm -hmm. So it says here, from uh, verse 3 on, I urge you as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different teaching or doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations rather than the divine training that is known by faith. And the goal of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart a good conscience and sincere faith. So these three things, love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith. So if we keep this as our goal, uh, it will help us, right? Mm -hmm. In our teaching or in our learning, it doesn't really address any of these three things. Uh, so it may not be purposeful or helpful. But if any of the teaching uh, comes that violates any of these things, then they really uh, should be just put to the side. We can listen to them, but we should not jump in with an opinion, right? 
So. Indeed. Well, I really, really appreciate your time this morning, Pastor Lee, as always. And um, I'm really looking forward to putting this out. Thank you to everyone out there who um, really have ears that hear. They could hear the true, message, the true message and the testimony of our Lord Jesus in it. Um, and to be able to make decisions, not only in this election, but in life. So uh, we, we thank God for that. And Pastor Lee, stay on just for a few moments after I stop the recording so we can say you know, a proper goodbye. Um, but thank you for everyone else for listening out there and joining in uh, with us today. And one, there will be more last, to come. One last comment. Uh, yes, one sir. Because I felt it's important. So if you have uh, gone through the spirit of respect, appreciation, belief, and then come to a critical understanding. And if you still decide to vote for one candidate over the other, so whether you decided to uh, go for Joe Biden after you've decided, mm -hmm. because you've done all your... Uh, self-examination and then you listen to issues you have the right to do so and no one should uh, so because you have to answer to your conscience so if you think after you have examined all the information and you thought through carefully and you think that Joe Biden should be the one go for him if you vote for Trump just because you are pressured then you have violated your own conscience right so mm -hmm. God examines you personally so so we should not uh, put a false conscience on any one. So this applies to uh, any topic, right? So do your own work and then stand because God will justify you based on the process of uh, how you have come to that decision. He will hear you out. And even though you have made a wrong decision, but you have made it using the right posturing and you have done your work, that's fine. So because the Lord looks at you at that personal level. So don't feel that you're being violated, right? But I'm sure if you have look, looked through all the values and what really uh, uh, each candidate brings, then you would go for one who can really uh, bring the greatest good uh, to the nation, answering all those questions. So, so be very fair-minded, but don't be... Uh, don't look down on a person who chose the other party. So it works both ways. Indeed, indeed. And one, one thing uh, that I can say that I learned from you over the years, Pastor Lee, is to be challenged to think, right? And not just follow popular opinion either way, yeah, but to be able to really sit and, and have a clear conscience before the Lord mm -hmm. on a decision that you make. And I've learned over the years that if I make a wrong decision, but my heart was postured before the Lord, he would always recover me, always. Yeah. You know, so and I've learned that over the years. And so more and more, we see that we make less and less mistakes because we are posturing ourselves before the Lord. We're listening very carefully to uh, what he says and then what's being said. And then we can make you know proper decisions. So Indeed. I, I, and I so appreciate that from you over the years. I've, I've learned it over and over. I, I guess I would stay, say that I'm still learning it. Um, because as you said, uh, I'm, I'm the person who can have 10,000 opinions. But I, I want to be able to stand before the Lord with a clear conscience that said, okay, Lord, based on what you have revealed to me, uh, the Son of God has been revealed to me and in me. These are the decisions I made. And I am, you know, at your mercy for everything else. <laughs> so, indeed. So, again, thank you so much, Pastor Lee. It's my job.